Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In his short piece, The Crowd is Untruth, Søren Kierkegaard is speaking a little bit hyperbolically, but he, he makes it very clear that what he's talking about is not any sort of truth, like, for example, that there are words on the chalkboard or that you're watching or listening to this, but rather all the things that fit into what he, at one point in this essay, calls the religious spiritual and intellectual domains, everything that has to do with something of fundamental value, or as he'll call it a little bit later, with the eternal. And he wants to say that those sorts of things cannot be left up to the crowd. The crowd cannot be, as he says, the court of last resort. You can't ballot them, uh, whether you're doing so with clickers in the classroom or people texting into American Idol or having a proposal and a referendum or anything like that. When it comes to the things that fundamentally matter that cannot be dealt with in that way, the crowd is inevitably going to be un truth. An untruth is not simply falsity. It stands in the way of any possible access to something that would in fact be truth. Now, what are the, the domains that he's going to discuss and why is this such a problem? So the crowd, by appealing to it, by, by making that the the hallmark, the center, the value of one's existence, you lose touch with God, the eternal, and you lose touch with yourself as the, what he calls the single individual. You're not really treating yourself as an individual. You're treating yourself as simply part of a crowd. So he, he tells us at one point that what ends up happening through this dynamic is that it makes individuals unrepentant. They don't think that they're doing anything wrong when they do something wrong. When they say they've got something uh, you know, that, that is right, but they're actually doing the wrong thing, they're in error and they, they won't admit it. They won't deal with that. They also become irresponsible because who are they in fact responsible to and in what way are they responsible if they're just members of a crowd rather than individuals who can be held responsible? He says that there's a lessening of responsibility. They end up being treated as just one of many. And he gives you examples of this. He says a crowd um, you know, either renders the single individual this way or weakens his responsibility by making it a fraction of his decision. A crowd will do things that the individuals themselves would not feel all right in doing or perhaps in even considering. So he associates it in general, this, this notion of the crowd, with three main things. And they all start with P in the English language. Politics or politicians. Now, we have to point out that, that Kierkegaard does see a legitimate domain in which politicians can operate and, you know, decisions can be made about those sorts of things quite legitimately. Um, and then there's what he calls the public and the press, which he talks more about in, in other works, but which he mentions here. So if we look at what he has to say about um, politics, he says that, um, you know, the, the person who actually, yeah, there's no one who has more contempt for what it is to be a human being than those who make it their profession to lead the crowd. Let someone, some individual, 
human being certainly approach such a person. What does he care about him? That is too small a thing. He proudly sends him away. There must be at least a hundred. And if there are thousands, then he bends before the crowd. He bows and scrapes. What untruth. Now, are all politicians like this? No, of course, there are plenty who, you know, listen to individuals and decide to fix the pothole that you came to see the aldermen about. And they, you know, uh, care about you and they get involved. And But that means that they're not acting like other politicians. They're not doing the usual thing of politics, which is to see what as many people think or to assemble them all together and make decisions on that basis. So politicians in general lead and address the crowd. And he says they address the crowd as the court of last resort, meaning that they, you know, if push comes to shove, as we say, if you have to make a decision, you go with what the larger number or at least some number are going to say is the right thing. Um, now, he says, of course, that um, that which in politics and similar domains, which would be you know, the marketplace, uh, perhaps educational institutions, has its validity, sometimes wholly, sometimes in part, <coughs> becomes untruth when it is transferred to the intellectual, spiritual, and religious domains. So he says... I will add that by truth, I mean eternal truth, but politics and the like has nothing to do with eternal truth. Politics can't determine any of these sorts of questions. You don't let politics decide intellectual matters. The intellectual matters should be decided on their own basis. You don't let politics decide religious matters. You don't let it decide spiritual matters, according to Kierkegaard. So... What else do we have going on here? There's what he calls the public. And this is something that Kierkegaard devotes a lot of discussion to in many different works. He says that this is something fairly new. And, he, and he's right about this because one of the things that um, other theorists have, have looked at and talked about at great length is the development in modernity of what we call the public sphere as opposed to other ways of looking at things politically, and the appeal to publicity or public opinion. And saying, you know, what would the people think about this? Or what will they say? What will people have to say if, for example, we put this out on the internet? You know, and, and, and we're in a time of hyper-publicity ourselves, uh, and this kind of ties together with the press that we're going to look at in a moment. But first, let's talk about this notion of the public. He says that it's an abstraction. It's a, it's a crowd, but it's not a crowd of individuals that you can identify and say, ah, that's the guy from down the street. Ah, that's the guy from the town over there. Oh, there's my professor. Oh, there's, there's my grocer or anything like that. Instead, the public is this amorphous, abstract not quite entity. You can't even say that it has true being or existence, but it exerts an important effect within modern societies. So he says, um, here we go. The crowd is untruth. I could weep in, in every case. I can learn to long for the eternal. When I think about our age's misery, even compared with the ancient world's greatest misery, uh, in that the daily press and anonymity make our age even more insane with help from the public, which is really an abstraction, which makes a claim to be the court of last resort in relation to the truth. So that's where this, you know, the buck stopping here is. But there is no place for the buck to stop. So there's always somebody who's speaking for or representing the public, but you never actually know what the public is. And it becomes this force that we kowtow to, that we uh, you know, take into account. We, we get worried about the public and what they're going to think of us unless we have the capacities to, to resist those temptations. He, he goes on a little bit further and he says, assemblies which make this claim surely do not take place. There's never any point where the entire public is assembled. And yet, this is something that we fear, something that 
we can feel oppressed by, something that we can also appeal to and sort of ride as we would on the crest of a great wave lifting us up. Look at all the likes I've got on Facebook or in YouTube or pick whatever you, you want. That's an appeal to a certain kind of public. That's an, a tangible, although rather abstract because it's just, you know, computer, uh, uh, you know, code really. Uh, but there's something you can actually look at on the screen that's a somewhat more concrete way of representing the public. But then it can turn against you in all sorts of thumbs downs or dislikes or anything like that. And he says that um, this, this public is anonymous. It ultimately is no one. So he says... Um, in ancient times, the relatively unrepentant crowd was the almighty of all these people gathered together, shouting and doing terrible things, right? But in the present, in the modern age, he says, there, now there is the absolutely unrepentant thing. No one, an anonymous person, the author, an anonymous person, the public, sometimes even anonymous subscribers, therefore, no one, no one. And... So this is part of the condition of, of the crowd of modern times. This is why in all these matters of religious, spiritual, intellectual significance, the crowd is untruth. Then he talks about a little bit here, the press. He doesn't go into great detail about it. What role does the press play? The press, you might say, is where the public attains some of its representation. Does so also in, in the political sphere. Politicians can make you know, recourse to the public. They can claim to speak for it. But the press in modern times, the fourth estate, as we often call it, is the place where this anonymity of the public gets presented. Public opinion is against this politician. Public opinion is against this religious doctrine. Public opinion is for this intellectual development. This is progressive. This is not progressive. This is, you know, uh, good and conservative. This is not. All of that is the press in one form or another, whether it's a printing press or whether it's somebody doing a podcast or it's somebody posting things on Facebook or uh, all the other you know, types of traditional media that, that have their, their fingers everywhere else and all interconnect with each other. All of those are ways in which the crowd speaks itself and speaks to itself and can suck in the individual who is not wary, who is not keeping themselves apart from it. In all of these... There is untruth, at least in the respect that Kierkegaard is talking about. Uh, we're talking about eternal truth, things that really, really matter. None of these politicians, the public, the press, the way that Kierkegaard understands them, the way that he depicts them here, none of them can actually understand or articulate or embody the truth.